You know what time it is, guys. Blood Month! Blood Month! Blood Month! Blood Month. That's right. The Last Kingdom Season 5 has been out for one week. We're going to break it down with our spoiler reviews, talking about Uhtred, Brita, Ethel Fled, Ethel Stan, R.I.P. Ethel Fled? Young Uhtred. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Nutrid. Oh, hey. Oh. That's right. We're breaking down Season 5 of The Last Kingdom. Season 5 is 10 episodes, which roughly adapts the plots of the ninth and 10th novels in Bernard Cornwell's Warrior Saxon stories. The ninth novel is Warriors of the Storm, and the 10th book is titled The Flame Bearer. So that's what this season is based on. Let's go real quick. Catfish, what is your rating out of 10 for Season 5? I'm going to give this 9 out of 10, what I like to call double P's. Double, double P's. P's. Yeah, Prudent Peerlegs. Ooh. Also known as double S's. Wait, double S. Yeah, Shore Sitters. This season was, to me, was different than the other seasons. Whenever so. I used to tell people about, you got to watch this show. It's like, it's like Game of Thrones, but it's not as complex, but it's way more fun. And I thought to myself, as we were watching this season, me and, and Lady Catfish, and we were like, this is as much fun. Why is it not as much fun? The reason why it was not as complex as Game of Thrones and more fun was that the stakes seemed used to seem really low to me. Like, there were a few big people who died one or two a year, but for the most part, Uhtred was the one who was in trouble. And we always know, Uhtred's going to be fine, right? Somehow, he's on a boat, doesn't get ad enough, adequate enough food for four months. He's still going to be fine. Even after four months, he'll be able to kill somebody where he can barely pick up a sword. His wife abandons him because he's a heathen. No problem. He finds another wife. That <laughs> wife dies. No problem. He starts to have sex with the Queen of Mercia. Queen of Mercia is busy ruling the state. No problem. He finds somebody else. Like, that was why it was more fun. So this season was less fun, but it was also more complex. What have the last couple of seasons been missing? A real true bad guy that stuck around for long enough. Alfred mm. was a great character because not only was he a bad guy that I hated, but you also completely understood his actions. So he was like a more complex bad guy. I mean, I, I sympathize with the way he felt. I'm like, he, he really feels that way. He's coming from an honest place, especially when he was having sex with the ladies who would come in and deliver his food. But he was a great character. He was missing. We'd have bad guys come up every once in a while, and they'd be easily dispatched. Or it was a long time before he met the one-eyed dude and his father who killed his entire the, the Ragnarsson clan. So this year, we had a true big bad that got to be almost as complex as some of the big bads in Game of Thrones. And I'm talking, of course, about Nutrid. No. I am talking about Ethel Helm. He was a great big bad this season. I also love what happened with Stiora. So although it was less fun, it was a lot more emotional this year. I really felt it. I mean, at one point I was worried that with all the deaths that the movie would just be uh, Uhtred by himself singing some songs. But at least he's still got Finnan around. He's got Stiora around to pick up Uhtred slack, which he showed a lot of this season. Well, Catfish, you're talking about the upcoming f Capper film, The Last Kingdom, Seven Kings Must Die, and we'll be talking about that in a bit. But 9 out of 10 is really high. Let's mm -hmm. go to Double M. Double M, what is your ranking for Season 5 of The Last Kingdom? Okay, well, let me tell you that this season had me flailing about like a Saxon in the bed air. <laughs> but I really got a lot of emotion out of this particular season. It just totally emotionally drained me because I watched it all in one day, the first day it came out. But I'm going to give it 9.5 out of 10, mm -hmm. what I call double Bs. Double, double Bs. Bs? Yeah, Burning Bebenbergs. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was, uh, I thought that was such an appropriate thing. Destiny is all, mean, merely means that a rainstorm is coming, basically, <laughs> as far as this goes. But nonetheless, I, I absolutely loved this season, even though it did after, I don't know, we we got the news in episode two about Ethel Fled, and from there, it just, in terms of just people just dropping off and continually mm -hmm. punching me in the gut over and over and over again, I didn't realize how much I loved these characters until I lost them. And then once I lost them, I was like, oh my gosh, or as I was losing them, I was 
basically a, a baby. I, I, I was crying because I watched, and I couldn't stop watching, so it was just like I was punishing myself. It would have gone down a full point for that, but the fact that they managed to bring in Hild somehow at the end, that brought it back up a point five. I even liked, and I know you guys know that last season I was way down on the, the music score. I even liked the music score better, and I'll get into that later. Wow. What about you, Bubba? Well, guys, I'm going to have the lowest ranking of anybody. Mm -hmm. I am only going to give mm -hmm. season five 8.5 out of 10 OM. GOs. OMGOs. Yeah. OMGOs, as you may know, at the very end of the season is, oh my God, Osbert, where the hell you been? <laughs> wait, and wait, and, and how about the momentary Osbert? Wait, who the hell are you again? <laughs> yeah. Google who Osbert is. Oh, okay. He was the infant that Uhtred's late wife died giving birth to back in season three, and now he's been brought back. I've mentioned we've reviewed all five seasons of The Last Kingdom here on Double P Podcast. You can reach out to us at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ on YouTube. Give us a like. Give us a comment down below with your ranking of the season. And I've mentioned in all the other seasons, I go, well, I've read the books that this season is based on. I've read the first seven novels in Cornwell's series. And so finally, we reached a season of the TV series where I hadn't seen any. And I just love these characters. It's exactly as you described it, Double M. I have grown over these five seasons and reading all these books to really like these characters. And I almost feel like the show was overcrowded with them because there's so many that you can like. So that does mean, oops, we got to make some room, especially if we're going to add even more characters. Osferth, goodbye. Ethelfled, goodbye. Brita, goodbye. Haston, goodbye. So we lost a lot of people who've been around, people like Brita from the very first season. So uh, I did buy in to the thought that we're saying goodbye to these characters that I've followed for so long. I thought it was really good. 8.5 is a great rating, but somehow I'm the lowest. Listeners, once again, we like to say, who cares what we think? We want to know what you think. You can tell us on our social media places down below on YouTube. We reached out on Twitter and you guys loved it. We gave you four options. Did you consider season five brilliant? Ooh, tread, ooh, tread. Well, 86% of you guys said the season mm -hmm. was brilliant. We said, did you think it was good? Did the gods favor season five? 14% said yes, the gods Solid. favored season five. That's it. We had two other options. We said destiny is all right. Or we also had Arsling Aethelhem. Nobody voted for the two lower options. Listeners, you guys, viewers, you loved season five. We are right there with you. So, How about Bubba, I have, let me just say this. I just just a couple things because I have not read all the books, but I'm wondering if I got further than you because I did notice at this point. I mean, obviously, Brita, they've chosen her to have a lot more import in the uh, the show than in the books. But also, as far as I've gotten in the books. The uh, Sig Trigger Stiora storyline is completely different. Well, they they are juggling th some things around in these books, and you're pointing me to the books, Catfish, and it makes me think Bernard Cornwell, the author of these books. He said a couple of things, but one of the reasons why he said he decided to even write this series is he felt like a lot of people in his native England didn't really know how the kingdom of England, the country of England was formed. And so we thought, oh, I should write a series of novels where it's exciting and action and fiction, but it hits these real life battles that shows how England was formed. And so this is, you know, he's created a fictional character, Uhtred, and, and certain other characters that interact with real life characters like King Edward and Ethel Fled and St such. Ethel Stan. Right, right. These are real life characters. And if you go to Wikipedia, you're going to learn spoilers about them. But he did it to kind of show how his country of England was formed. Now, one thing that this led to, because he wanted this to show how the country was formed in all these battles, the fictional character of Uhtred was born in 856. The story here in season five of the television show takes place around 918, which would make Uhtred 62 years old. Well, it makes it makes sense because he was around Alfred's age. Well, he wasn't and, supposed to be. The character of the book was like a a, a teen, like 17 or 18. Right, but for example, met, when right. he was a young adult, yes. 
Uh, I mean, now he's now dealing with like grandchildren who are yes, who are old, who are uh, maybe just a few years younger than the person playing Uhtred. I right. will say this: at first, I was like, well, they didn't bother to age him up at all, which he said they did, but they did it to poor Ethelfled. But I believe that they did that to Ethelfled for different reasons, just to show her being sick because Aylesworth just had like a tiny touch of head gray in her hair. <laughs> You mean Grandma Aylesworth? Yeah, Grandma Aylesworth. Well, how about this? Before we break down, and listeners, this is big spoilers. Mm -hmm. We're going to break down all the beats and fun of season five. Before we dive into that, I want to go around the horn and ask you guys, do you feel like the show needs a closing movie, this film, Seven Kings Must Die? Or do you feel like this was a great place where the story could have ended? Let's go to you first, Matt. Double M, what do you think? I honestly feel like Bubba and Catfish that if you chose or or if for some reason a movie couldn't be done, this was as good as you could possibly end the series. It was great in the fact that all of the sacrifice finally came to him achieving his goal. And I don't know if you really need to see Edward or Edward's successors or whatever coming against the Scots. They did set it up beautifully for the movie at the end and the fact that both the Scots and Edward are going to be coming after Uhtred in one way or another, trying to gobble that land up. So you can have it that way. But it also was a really good place to just stop if you say, I can't lose any more characters. I'm not going to watch the movie. This is a perfect ending for me, even though it killed everybody that I loved. How about you, Catfish? Do you need the final movie? Could the show have ended just here? It's possible they made a few tweaks to set up the future, but I felt like when they wrote this, they knew it was going to be the last season. They told a complete story. They have him looking back on all the people that died. It was a complete wrap-up. So I'm completely happy with it, except for the fact that I would take 10 more seasons of this show, and I don't care whether... He looks the same, and he's dealing with people's great, great, great grandchildren. <laughs> I don't give a rat's ass. I love the character of Uhtred. Once again, uh, you know what I found great of this show is there were things that would be hinted at in the episodes, and in the recap for the next episode, Uhtred would tell you exact. You, you would be like, and 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 Kinleif and and Ethel. Uh, Win, Flynn, Ails win, yeah. Ails win, uh, are having a romance, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> thank you for confirming that. Uhtred. He did that like three different times, where he's like, oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Here's all the latest gossip in Northumbria. Exactly, exactly. I will let come and sip the tea with me. <laughs> Well, hey, listeners, once again, we want to know how you felt about season five. Are you glad this final movie is going to be coming in about a year? Or do you think the show and story ended perfectly with Uhtred getting his birthright? Uhtred of Bedenburg back in Bedenburg. Let us know. You can find us on social media. Once again, at double PHQ, the word double, the single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters, at double PHQ for, on Twitter and Instagram, facebook.com slash double PHQ. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, like, give us those comments on what you thought, and you can watch all of our reviews of the previous four seasons. Guys, we're going to get in, and because this story covers so much across these 10 episodes, we're just going to kind of dive into some of the big storylines. And for me, the first half of the season, even though she survived till much later in the season, to me, the first inciting incident really in this season was Brita is finally coming for revenge. She hates Uhtred, and even though she had had a child— even though she had gone off to Iceland and found a new group that she could call her own, she would not be happy until she got revenge on Uhtred, who had cost her in her own mind so much. Before we break down any specific beats, how did you guys feel about Brita being, in a lot of ways, the big bad here at the start of the season? I mean, they've been setting it, they've been setting it up for so long, for so long, and I, I just loved her. Uh, her anger was good. I was kind of not feeling that storyline, except for when um, she was sad about her daughter that died because her daughter was such a sweet person who fingered people for death. <laughs> she was a seer. <laughs> she, yeah. And she, when she saw your death, you were soon to die. Well, how about this? Uhtred had his son, young Uhtred, 
castrated by Brita. Mm. And he knows that she's coming for his line. He doesn't know where she is, but he's going to stand on a dock in Room Kofa and start screaming, Brita, I am coming for you. You will not get me. She's hundreds of miles away. She can't hear him at all. And she, he's still screaming her name because he's so angry. Yet once again, at the end, he almost wants to give her forgiveness. Matt, how did you feel about Brita being the big bad at the start of the season? No, I th- thought it was good, and I thought that it was uh, something that needed to happen. The way that it happened was very heartbreaking, especially with her storyline and what happens to her daughter. And like Catfish said, I feel like my relationship with Brita is a love-hate relationship, depending on which season you're in. And I like being on either side of that equation. I love being on either side of that equation. I think she's a really compelling character. And I feel like that when we got presented with this thing that happens at F Witch, is that how you say that? F a witch with her daughter. And then the relationship with Purig, Purig in this season, I feel like that really made what happened to her in the end even that much more impactful. The thing that I can't get is why okay. does everybody want Uhtred to kill them and send them to Valhalla? What, what, what makes Uhtred so special? Why is it him killing them? Everybody's like, send me to Valhalla. You do it. You do it. And there's a number of characters this season that, that do that. Uh, I don't see his sword being any more special than anybody else's, especially if it's just an execution. And then she me? doesn't even get what she wants. That is the most in club in Valhalla, <laughs> killed by Uhtred. That is like you got to pass the velvet rope. Granted, it's not that exclusive a club, a club, but still, like he is a famed warrior, man. You, like you know, it's like you don't want to get killed by some pud who you know drove up in his uh, Volkswagen, took off, put some fake boots over his sneakers, and then and then joined three hundred other people in a, in a, as extras. You want to be killed by Uhtred, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bubba, do you think that Brita even made it to Valhalla? Given the way that uh, Stiora ended her instead of Uhtred? I mean, he put the sword in her hand as she was starting to bleed out, but did she even make it? Was it pretty worthless? And isn't Stiora right simply because he, he's willing to kill everybody else, but not the person who neutered Uhtred? The show did a great job at the end of Brita's time, making me understand why Uhtred might be tempted to spare her. What I had a harder time with is after she and her posse have sacked York and they've ruined Sig Trigger and they, you know, <laughs> kept poor Stiora hiding down in a gutter for so long. I had a harder time understanding why Uhtred would let her escape from York and not capture her then. Obviously she's got the body of her dead daughter in her in her hands. I understand that that's tragic, but you could still capture her. It felt like the show presented it to me as if Uhtred let her go. He and, did. And th- that okay. part, he I, didn't, says that part I didn't like. Yeah. Um, and and he, he knew. I mean, yeah, right there is where Stiora, like, takes the mantle of Uhtred. Like, all she needs to say is, like, have you not watched this show? Have you not watched everything that you did with Alfred? You know, the, the risk you took, like, you got to stand up, man. But maybe well, that's part of why he stands up at the end. Until he falls down fighting with Ethelstan because he's an old man. (laughs) Well, okay. We should point out, Matt, you want to touch on this, that when we first see Brita in that first episode in Iceland, who makes a cameo? Yeah, it was wonderful. There's a woman who's singing the ritual song and everything. That's actually one of the composers. I did not see composer John Lund in the scene. I thought that if they were going to put her in the scene for a cameo, then they would put him in as well. And maybe he was there and I just missed him. But that is definitely Ivor Paulstetter, that she's one of the composers, and she was the one doing the actual singing as they were beating the drums, and uh, Rita's daughter was picking whoever was going to jump into the pit, which was awful. (laughs) Uh, But yeah. Lovely voice, that woman. All right. So we had the the Prillig and Brita Roadshow. What were your thoughts on that, Catfish? What better buddy comedy? I mean, I mean... We got Abbott Costello, uh, you know, we got uh, Jerry Lewis and uh, whoever, Lewis Lewis and Martin, you know, uh, this is it. We got Bubba and Catfish. I mean, this, it goes in the annals of uh, best comedy uh, duos. You know, Pierre Leg is is one of those really cool guys, too, because he, 
you know, he's a fighter, except for when it comes to some, someone has to pilot the boat, then that's what he does. He's a fighter, but he's a priest. He feels deeply in his beliefs. I feel like if there were more people around like that and less like Alfred, that maybe Uhtred would have been a little bit cooler. Mm. What was your thought on the on the road show between the priest and the Dane warrior or wannabe Dane warrior in Brita? What was your thoughts, Matt? Well, I really was enthralled by it. I actually I found it very powerful. It's one of the things that brought me back around. To, I mean, other than, of course, losing your daughter makes you feel sympathetic towards Brita in a way. But the thing that made it so conflicting about what was going to happen between her and Uhtred at the end was Perlig's attempt to redeem her in a lot of ways. I, I feel like that that was a very important storyline as to how what led to Brita's end. Okay, so Brita, she caused a lot of trouble, but in the end, all her forces in her troublemaking faded out to where she returned to the home, where she and Uhtred, they had both been, they were both prisoners of Dane invaders, where they came, returned to the beginning, and yeah, she know, is put down. This is one where I feel like it felt like she got sh- short shrift. I mean, we've talked about the only bad thing about this series is sometimes things go mighty fast. And it feels like the conflict with Brita and and her crew could have been a whole season um, and maybe should have been. But they just had the time left. I mean, you know, we, we didn't have enough. It would have been cool to see since we had Sig Trigger's brother who was involved in it, the whole thing. It, this really mm-hmm. could have been it feels like. That didn't get to flourish as much as it should have. Let's go around the horn. Whose end affected you more? Brita's or the next character whose storyline we're going to talk about a bit? Lady Ethelflaed. Whose death affected you more? Matt, I'll let you go first. Okay. I definitely was affected more by Ethelflaed. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe it's just the way that the character was portrayed. Even up to the end, her bravery, there was moments of doubt in her, but never moments really of conflict that I found throughout the courses of the season. And so it seemed so much more impactful for her to be the victim of something of which she has no control after someone who's been so in control the entire time. Uh, How about you, Catfish? Yeah, so in control that she can refuse to give it up to Uhtred. I'm not sure that I could even do the same. <laughs> I'm not sure I could be like, no, I've had never told him of, about the secret gate, man. Taste of heaven, and now I'm going to deny it. Yeah, no, it's Ethelfled. I, I, it's funny because you know the adult Ethelfled has has not been around since the first season. Was it the third season? The fourth? No, third season for sure. Right, where she, um, she was a kid in maybe season one and season two, and now this actress yeah. took over. So we haven't known her as long as Brita, but I feel like, uh, you know, and we should maybe feel a little bit more for, for Brita, but I, 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 I stopped having, I don't, I don't know why, just sympathy for Brita a, a long time ago. And so um, it, it's Ethel Fled for sure. I think it is Ethel Fled for me as well, just because Brita has been on, the opposite side of Uhtred, our protagonist, our hero for so long. But just looking at Ethel Fled's story here in season five, it turns out Edith, who some people call a witch, can't cure cancer back in the 10th century, 9th century. But she decides not to tell Uhtred because she knows she doesn't want to be a distraction for Uhtred as he goes to help free Sigtrigger and his daughter Stiora from the sacking of York. I mean, and then she does... To- you go to learn medicine in Normandy, man. You learn the <laughs> Hippocratic Oath. You do not betray doctor-patient confidentiality. Well, she didn't tell Uhtred, and her plan, and I would wonder how you guys feel about the plan, is her plan is for her daughter, Elfwin, Elfwin, that's hard, but I think it's Elfwin, to replace her. And what we have seen, what the show has shown us of the adult Elfwin, or the teenage, however old she's supposed to be Elfwin, she doesn't look like she's ready to lead, but that's what F- Ethel Fled wants. And it turns out she and Uhtred do get one night together when Uhtred has saved York and then races back to see her. She goes out 
thinking that her daughter will be able to replace her as the Lady of Mercia, and that doesn't come true at all. So what did you guys think? I, I did wonder about why she would be so headstrong to put her daughter, who definitely did not seem like a leader at this stage of her life, Elfwin, in charge of Mercia. What were your thoughts there? Why not go to uh, Eldhelm, her, her advisor with the short bowl haircut? Why not go to him? What do you think, Matt? Well, I, I think all you need to do is look to who Ethel Fled's mother is. I mean, mm. she she is her mother's daughter. She's very pragmatic. She makes good decisions most of the time, but she also gets very set in her ways. And her her ways being set made no room for the fact that this canker would affect her in the way that it did. And I, I feel like that that uh, was, in a way, forcing this on, on Elfwyn was a little bit reminiscent of some of the earlier decisions that Ellsworth had made. What do you think, Catfish? Was was asking your daughter to replace you a wise move or the only move? What do you think? <laughs> it does not seem like a wise move at all, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, the only reason that I think she is now she is now fit to rule, if she's even going to, it doesn't seem like, uh, it seems like Edward's like, mercy be mine now, <laughs> is that she hadn't, she, yeah, she had no attachment to uh, Mercia or the people or even uh, adult responsibilities. It, it was a, it does seem like a desperate move that was, that was not like her. Right. Well, what she didn't, she, she didn't want war anymore. She had tried to have resolve so many conflicts of her country and she did. She definitely was the lady of mercy of what they showed us. She did care about her people. She did want things to go well, but that leads us into the, third storyline we're going to touch on and really the driving force of the whole season wasn't even Brita or Ethel Fled's death. It was Ethel Helm, the father-in-law to yeah. King Edward. His plot to do anything to get so what good. he wanted and that's his grandson Elf Weird. And he starts off, he's like, okay, I want Elf Weird Lord of Mercia. So even before he knows Mercia is going to be up for grabs, He's having goons try to kill Ethelstan because he knows, I don't want this rival for Edward's throne. I want it to pass to my son. Let's kill Ethelstan. That doesn't work. Once he does get word from his goons that, oh, Ethelfled is is dying, he is hog-tied in getting his grandson, Elfweird, as Lord of Mercia. He's bribing eldermen. He's doing all sorts of things to get in good, and he especially has, hates that the king has a new side piece in Agafu. However, you pronounce his new uh, hotties, who's he's ignoring Ethelhelm's daughter, Elsfled, and instead he's fooling around. So Ethelhelm, he is wheeling and dealing, and it is going crazy. And then one of my favorite moments of the season is when suddenly you see all the all the eldermen being slaughtered in the streets. And you think, oh, no, what's going on? What's going on? It's Ethelhelm. Do you think it's Ethelhelm? I couldn't think. It was so shocking. I was like, didn't Ethelhelm bribe them to get his grandson to be Lord of Mercia? What's going on? But and maybe then, he thought there was a last minute. Yeah, whatever. Maybe he thought right. there was a last minute change of heart. But instead, it's King Edward coming with uh, with what I described in our chat as Big Dick Energy saying, yeah, I don't think my niece is going to take take charge of Mercia. You know who I think should? This guy. <laughs> I loved it. Who loved has it. two thumbs, a beard to make me look older, and is going to kill all these suckers? <laughs> who's going to fight my uh, who's going to fight my ascension to King of Mercia? When everybody's dead, nobody. <laughs> I Guys, I this. really liked Edward up until that point. I, I oh. mean, yes, he had. You he didn't had like him for doing he it. He seemed like he had matured a lot. He seemed like he was a little more steady in his decisions. Mm -hmm. And then he, he, he again, the ambition of fulfilling and catfish. I think you can blame Daddy for this. You know, he has such an ambition to fulfill his father's dream you of mean unifying King England. That he he'll do anything for it, and it's one of the things that makes him impatient. It's one of the things that makes him make that bad decisions. It's one of the things that makes him just really unlikable. And I was even starting to like him just a little bit up until that point. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'm back out. I'm back out on Edward. No more for me. That's uh, funny, Matt. Matt. I, Matt, I was the opposite. I loved him because he did it. I was like, hell yeah! Don't let Matt. your father-in-law scheme behind your back. If you take a generous look at what Edward did, he was like. 
this isn't going to be disorderly. This isn't going to be a fighting amongst Mercians. Mm-hmm. I'll just take it, and then everybody can chill out. Catfish, thoughts? So let's let's talk about Edward's two big bad decisions. So mm-hmm. the first one was this right. one, I presume. And if he hadn't done that, then Ethelhelm's plot would have succeeded. Correct. I assume, and his ambitions w- might have ended there, Catfish. It might have been over. Mm. Instead, and I ass- get so much more drug out. And I assume that you think that his other big bad decision, since you mentioned his impatience, was storming Bebenberg Castle. Yes. Okay. Oh, I didn't. I and didn't what that, happened but, if he yeah. hadn't stormed the castle? What would have happened to uh, our friends uh, Uhtred, Elf Witchy Womb, and? Um, and 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 his boys. All, all Edward, all Edward's impatience did was nearly get himself, and it did get half of his men pushed off of a cliff. Okay, that was really smart. Who cares about half of his men? <laughs> if he hadn't charged at that time, Uhtred and his boys were dead. No, they weren't. So okay, it's Uhtred. Nope. He's got a movie. It's not. Gonna, he's not going to die. <laughs> all right, I want to hold off his second bad move. Once again, I thought Edward. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I loved that he was so ambitious. I loved it. I loved it too. It didn't make uh, me think that he was. He was. Look, he's a king. When you're a king, sometimes you get to break some eggs, aka Elderman. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, but let's. The, the real cause of all of this is Ethelhelm. Mm, he, he's, right. the, he's the father-in-law. You know, right. Edward isn't. If you no matter whether you call this act smart or stupid, if he's not doing this stuff, then obviously Edward's not having to act upon it. And so my question to you is Ethelhelm, mm. the Tywin without the smarts. I mean, he he does mm. all of this scheming, he does all of this plotting and all of this political politicizing For just his like family, Tywin did right? mm-hmm. from Game of Thrones, but he doesn't have the wherewithal to execute it. It seems like well, I don't know. He seems to do. I mean, if it hadn't been for um, Uhtred, son of Uhtred, uh, he might have succeeded. I mean, he uh, sure. I mean, Tywin never got shit talked the way <laughs> Ethelhelm did at Bevenberg. <laughs> um, <laughs> but still, it was going to come true. A lot of the things that he was advising the King of the Scots, he was like, just wait, they'll come after us. Just I mean, he 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 had some good ideas. Also, he knew if you want to get information, what you want to do is you want to deal with priests with gambling problems. <laughs> <laughs> Heck, because that yeah. priest gave up all the goods. Yes. Everything. On Ethelflaed. If you want to blame somebody, blame that priest. Listen, he had Brita winning in six and then she lost. What was he going to do? That was his bet. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's follow on. So Ethelhelm's. Mm-hmm plot and Matt, i'm going to debate with you a bit ethelhelm really doesn't feel like he has any forces he feels more like a little finger he has to kind of backroom deal mm. where mm. tywin had a lot of power had land he i mean he's kind of a, maybe a cross between the two but in the world of game of thrones people respected and feared tywin well people obviously didn't respect ethelhelm in this world and they didn't really fear him either but he was very good at kind of planting seeds and trying to cause chaos, right? Let's get to this next story. So, okay, my grandson isn't going to be Lord of Mercia like I want. He is not finding favor. Edward might be liking his other son, you know, Ethel Stan, more than my grandson, Elf Word, excuse me. And so he's like, well, what do I got to do? I got to do something to kind of shake this up. So I'm going to pit the York Danes, those evil heathens, the Danes, versus the Saxons. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll literally do a, a false flag to cause a war between these people. And it actually works. Of course, what ends up happening is that it goes back to before this. So back when it was the, hey, we got to save York from Breda's forces. Aethelhelm was secretly telling the people of Mercia, hey, King Edward doesn't want you to help York. Let, you know, let these Danes fight amongst themselves. And that caused Sig Trigger back in York to be really upset that Edward didn't come help him. So Ethelhelm's like, well, I, you know, I, I feel like there's a spark there. I've got to do something else. I'll make it look like a holy woman has been killed by Danes, and that's what's going to cause this war. Of course, what does he not know? He doesn't know that his daughter, Aelfled, is traveling with this holy woman, Alice, and she ends up getting killed. Ethelhelm causes the death of his own daughter, Queen Aelfled. Hashtag, whoops. 
<laughs> it was the one moment that I actually just for a moment and of course it wasn't going to happen but mm -hmm. I still fantasized it's like maybe he'll realize how wrong he is and we can wrap this part up so that we can get to some other things oh, uh, oh, you know this going, was the thing Matt no it wasn't the thing it, it was it was the thing that seeded him to even do even worse things with Elfwin and and what have you. I, when he realized that his daughter was dead, I thought he might give up. He tried to give up. He wasn't allowed to. It would have been better he, if he did. All he did, he did for his grandson, even if that killed the grandson's mother. <laughs> so, hey, this got to kind of another favorite moment in season five for me, where who ends up discovering the dead queen, Elfled? Hasten. This is incredible. This SOB is still alive somehow. All the times he's tried to kill Uhtred, Uhtred's tried to kill him. He's alive. And guess what? When he discovers this, he almost turns into a good guy. And he's like, oh, man, this is going to cause a lot of trouble, a lot of fighting. Let me go tell Uhtred what's going on so uh, there isn't any war, any craziness. How did a you guys feel about – how did you guys feel – let's go to you first, Catfish. How did you feel about Haston suddenly being on Team Uhtred? I loved it. That guy has switched sides so many times. He's got every <laughs> uniform in the kingdom oh, yeah. in his closet. But I was surprised to see Haston back. Yep. I'm not sure why we needed him. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was surprised to see him. I mean, I was, I was happy to see him. I, I, you know, again, uh, you know, just as he has changed sides many times, I've decided whether I, you know, at the end, I, I, I think I finally, when I saw him this time, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I'm still going to like him. You know, with, with, no matter what he does, <laughs> hasten going to hasten. So, you know. <laughs> How about you, Matt? How did you feel about seeing I love SOB? seeing hasten, Bubba. I absolutely love seeing hasten. Here's a guy who has become the ultimate businessman. <laughs> you know, I mean, he is, he's the Tony Stark of the last kingdom. He sells to all sides and therefore he understands that this is bad for my business. If these guys mix it up, you know, and it's like, I like making money. I'm not going to stop making money. So I'm going to stop this. I love that decision. The thing that really gets you about Haston, we can talk about it later, but the thing that really gets about Haston is what he does at the end, because that is has yeah. nothing to do with business. Otherwise, he would have gone the other way, right? Yeah, so well, let's hold off on that, too, because okay. that was a great moment for me. But let's just let's just talk through this next bit, which happened. So, okay, Ethelhelm, who hasn't realized that his plot has ended up with the murder of his daughter, he's trying to get the Saxons real angry about the Danes killing this holy woman, and so he gets them to attack Rumkofa. Uhtred's fortress or town at this point. And so they go there and they put all the Danes in a church and they kill them. Oh my God. And this is where we see R.I.P. Osfirth, King Alfred's bastard son. Oh, it felt like maybe his role was, you know, maybe he didn't really have a role in the story anymore since he was probably in the story to show how Alfred had sinned and cheated on his wife and done things that his values should have told him not to do. And so Osfirth took the L right here. It really hurt <laughs> Finnan. And <laughs> it hurt Finnan. But then, of course, because the Danes have been killed in Rumkofa, what does that do? That gets Sig trigger, you know, mad as hell. And he wants to march. Uh, Athelhelm, say what you want about him. He did set up this war against Edward and Sig trigger. You know, once again, a false flag operation to get these two sides to fight. And somehow, Uhtred figured out who could be behind this only Athelhelm, and he goes to tell Edward. That was a part I wasn't so sure about how Uhtred could figure it out so much, but what did you think about this battle we have on the ice and the terrible tragedy that Uhtred can't stop in time to where Sigtrigger's men start killing a lot of Saxons, admittedly they're there with Athelhelm, and then because they're killing them all, Edward almost has no choice but to come in and save them, a.k.a. slash all Sigtrigger's men. What did you think, Matt? First of all, the way that this whole scenario ends is just horrible because mm -hmm. uh, it's horrible for it ends up being horrible for Uhtred, obviously uh, horrible for Stiora. Again, Elthahelm, if Elfward gets Mercia, this doesn't happen. I just get that feeling. You know, who do you blame? You blame Edward. That's who you blame. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but the whole idea, I mean, it, it, it's awful. I didn't get really Uhtred figuring it all out 
putting all the dots together. I think that they were there for us as viewers, but it didn't seem like there was a clear line to point to how Uhtred would put all those points together. It was a lot easier for, my, for us to see from the outside than I think it would have been for him to see on the inside. Nonetheless. I feel like that happened a lot this season with, mm. with Ethel Helm. A lot of people made some logical conclusions that seemed to be out of their uh, intelligence range that I just can't see. But for me, oh, I I love Sig Trigger. I love him. You know, also, I love him from the books. You know, in, in, in the books, he actually fights with Uhtred, and Uhtred puts his eye out. But Uhtred loves him because Sig Trigger fought with such joy. Mm-hmm. So he's happy to marry him off to Stiora. So uh, this character, this fun-loving, brawling, he's kind of like a, you know, Utra Jr. And I felt really, really bad when he lost it because for for a misunderstanding, a horrible misunderstanding that had nothing to do with a mistake that Edward made. (laughs) Well... Let's get to it, because the fallout of this is kind mm-hmm. of terrible for everybody. It may be not Edward, because now Edward has a foothold in Northumbria. But, you know, Edward's trying to get some peace. He offers it to Stiora, but she's like, you know, you just sentenced my husband to death. F you. She wants Sig Trigger. Sig Trigger wants the, you know, good death to Valhalla. So he makes his father-in-law kill him. Then because Stiora turns it down... Sig Trigger's really drunky McGee brother, Rog Valder, is suddenly in charge. And you're like, boy, that is a bad move to put him in charge of York. And it's really just terrible. And it doesn't even really work well for Ethelhelm because now his plots just keep failing and blowing up in his face. And he has to run for run for the hills. And so that gets us to pretty much the final <laughs> Ethelhelm plot that's going to lead us to the end of the season. He's like, OK. I've been doing this all for my grandson. I keep screwing my grandson over. To hell with it. (laughs) Let's just kill the king to make sure my grandson, Elford, takes over. So he's got to do a bunch of things. He he needs some bargaining chips. So he kidnaps Aelfwin. And for a brief time, he has his henchmen have Ails with the king's mother and Edith. He also goes to Scotland and talks, tells King Constantine. He's like, hey, you've seen this incursion. Edward's forces are really far north. He's going to come here unless you do something. So he gets King Constantine on his side by saying, hey, plus I can get you Elfwin as a bride. Things are building up good. And of course, what is very close to the Scotland lands but Bedenburg. And so the Northumbrian lords are siding with Constantine. And that includes Withgar, the cousin to Uhtred who has taken Bedenburg. I believe last season he took it. And this actor is really a, you know, he plays a villain and very well. He looks a villain part with Gar does. And so now we've got, we've got our forces on that side. Edward, he's not ready to go rescue his niece, Aelfwin, who's been taken by Ethelhelm's plot. What do you guys think? What do you think about this? Was Edward right to not, you know, rush to war and think, hey, I, I just got Mercia. Let's keep this straight. Well, what do you I think, feel Catfish? like everyone was going to be on. Everyone's going to be with him. I mean, even Ethelstan came over. The whole thing was good. And mm-hmm. then Finnan's like, well, I guess you just you got no one on your side, Kingy Wingy. And then Edward flips out. I blame Finnan for this, mm. for causing the extra 15 minutes between like, <laughs> we're going to go and I guess we're going to fight Edward before Edward says, OK, we'll go. Right. Way to blame but, Finnan. Uh, so that's really the only thing Finnan did all year long. He kind of eh, screwed up and helped Oscar yeah. get killed. And <laughs> now he pisses off the king and his the geeks <laughs> punch him. I love it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Edward was right to want to be patient. He realized that he was being goaded by Ethel Helm. Ethel Helm, yes. Yeah, so if he'd have just stuck with the plan... I'm sorry, is Edward's problem that he's patient or impatient? <laughs> because you bla- you said both things about him. In I, he your... was, he's impatient about uniting his father's kingdom, his, creating his father's vi- vision. He was doing the right thing about being patient, when Ethelhelm was burying him, why can't a guy be two different things at the same time? I, I just, I just, you, you're, you're saying he's impatient, but also patient. Also, you think he was well, right human, when catfish. everyone was, yeah, he's human. And this is mostly not his fault. All right. Hold on. <laughs> Instead hold of on. The mistake, but wait, before we do that, but before we do that, I just want to ask Matt. So you think granted 
everyone was saying we should go except for Edward. And so granted, that means that Aylesworth, who's always wrong, was one of those people. Exactly. So do you think that they were all wrong just because Aylesworth was with them? Or do you think they were all right and Edward is wrong and maybe Aylesworth just this was a broken clock is right very twice careful. Aylesworth is now a woman who can <laughs> kill a man with her own bare hands. OK, well, she manages to stab a knife through a guy's throat without gloves. Love so, <laughs> I love Aylesworth. I am so team Aylesworth. Any oh, side no. that she jumps on, I'm with. You know this, Catfish. We had this debate all last season. There's no reason to debate anymore. Aylesworth was right. She was always right. First of all, most of the time she was completely wrong. And second of all, <laughs> even when she's right, she presents it in such a horrible way that no one is likely to agree with her. Would, would you not have just had your whole soul fall out if it not been for the L's with humor the last few episodes of this season? Oh, yeah. Because, because mine humor. would have. I, I certainly, I thought that her stuff was hilarious. I loved it. How about when she met her new daughter-in-law and didn't know it was her new daughter-in-law? And she's like, look, I don't have time to meet your floozies, <laughs> Edward. Your harlot. So did you go oh, so, harlot? So good. How about her sharing her secret diaries with Alfred with her own granddaughter? I mean, that was so awkward and lovely. I loved it. It was hilarious. Right. Oh, yes. Your grandpa and I really got busy. <laughs> <laughs> When it's good. It's well, good. how about Edward? Shotgun wedding. My current wife, I just found out she's dead. Time to marry the baby mom. <laughs> Ouch. All right. So, hey, let's get to it. The mm -hmm. big battle, the battle for Bebenberg. You know, we're talking about Edward not really wanting to go do this. Uhtred probably wouldn't have gone to do this. Even to save Aelfwin, it was when, oh, wait, Aelfwin's in Bebenberg? That's when it's Yeah, called. right. That was, a, it was, that was a great moment because he's, like, saddling up the horse. I'm out of here. Yeah. And he's like, it's like Bebenberg. And he does one of those, turn to the camera. Roar. Roar. Bebenberg. <laughs> perfect. It was perfect. So let's get to it. This gets to the Battle of Bebenberg. Mm -hmm. I love it. This is what we've been waiting for so long. Uhtred, Sithric, and Finnan, they're like, hey, hold on, Edward. Let us see what we can do before you, you know, before you go to war. They look for allies. And who do they run into? Hild. Matt, let's hear it. What were your thoughts when you saw Hild return to the series? Uh, I shouted over and over repeatedly, Hild! 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 I was uh, jumping up and down for joy, Bubba. Absolutely and was. It was the one thing that saved me from my madness uh, that was happening from losing Oscar. Oh, from I, th losing I thought it was Ailes with humor that was saving you. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Catfish, did you even remember who Hild was? How about this? Oh, hell yeah, I remembered who Hild was. I did not remember that she was still alive. I was like, oh, Hild, <laughs> this is cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget. I don't know why Uhtred's moment when he's like, you know, if it wasn't for you in the church. And she's like, yeah, you're right. But the church. Ouch, man. Uhtred. Uhtred coming second place to the church. Tough, tough look. But hey, he's got Hild. He's got Heston. We're going to sneak into the fort of Bebenberg and we're going to rescue my love, Ethel Fled's daughter. This was when another poor decision by uh, Uhtred. Hmm. Haston? No. Anybody else? Not Haston. <laughs> He's there. He's there. You know, let's have him do it. <laughs> he knows okay. that he's shifty enough to pull it off. Let's give Team Uhtred credit. They actually got into the fort. Uhtred knew how to break in. So Uhtred, Sithric, and Finnick, they're getting into the fort. Everything's going great. We have one job. Rescue my love's daughter. But uh-oh, who does he see? He sees his cousin Withgar, and that gets his blood boiling, and Uhtred is going to screw up his own plan. And his team, Finn and, and Sith Trick, they turn themselves in to prevent Uhtred from blowing everything up. These guys, in some ways, they don't have much to do other than be Uhtred's friends, but we've grown close to Finn and we love Sith Trick, and so them stepping up, I really like this part a By lot. By the way, Uhtred never looked more ridiculous than when he was wearing that helm at Bebenberg. <laughs> that was, I mean, talk about emasculating. There was nobody, like, the day he was going to wear that, he didn't turn to the costume people and go, you are out of your flipping minds if you think I'm going to wear this. He's undercover Uhtred. Yeah, he like, give me, a, put me undercover in something that, that looks less dorky than this. 
Well, hey, the next thing that kind of really happens in this story is King Constantine has shown up and he confronts Haston, doesn't give up Uhtred in the end, and R.I.P. Haston loved it. Matt, what'd you think? Oh, yeah, this is this is the moment that I was talking about earlier in the fact that, man, you can look at anything that Haston has done over the course of all of his seasons and you can say it was all self-motivated. This is the one act, the final act, that doesn't seem quite so self-motivated because he knows he doesn't have a way out. And so he decides to do the right thing instead of the thing that might very minimal chance, but might save his skin. And that is what ultimately makes him one of the characters that I did feel terrible about losing. Yeah. Okay, so Edward, King Edward, he's got his army there. He's like, okay, let's go. They go up to the gate. He sends his son, he sends his son, Ethelstan, up to the gate to give his demands. You know, we want Ethelhelm, my father in law, turned over to me. I want my niece, Aelfwin, turned over to me. Hashtag no dice. There's a whole lot happening. This all leads up to the point where Constantine, King Constantine, who has been pretty observant, kind of almost an okay guy, kind of. Oh, you sees, know, let me say a little bit more. Yeah. He is. He is a good character. We we have an extra. We have what feels like an extra scene with him to get to know him. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. think to set him up for the movie, that he is going to be very cool as far as like, look, don't worry about this. I'm not going to pass with you. There's somebody I love. He does seem like a smart, cunning, and and a, and a good leader. So it was nice to have a, a really nicely fleshed out character here that we meet just very near the end. So Constantine kind of figures a way to turn this around on King Edward's forces. He sees, hey, the church is on fire. That means the Scots have arrived and they are going to win. They have got King Edward's forces being attacked on two sides. The English are getting pushed over a cliff. Now, Whitgar's got a great idea. He's like, let me get her to safety, and that safety involves parading her on the parapet with a (laughs) knife to her throat uh, to get get Edward's blood boiling. Yep, and uh, it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. Men are falling over the side. Edward and Ethelstan are in deep trouble. Oh, yeah, and then, wait, hold on. Then Uhtred... And Citric yep. and and yep. Finnan ride out to Stiora's troops and say, You cannot leave the field of battle. <laughs> and Stiora's <laughs> like, What are you doing, Utrid? You are not on the field of battle. And he's like, What well, let me explain to you something that will take a long time while Edward <laughs> is being pushed off the cliff. I'm sure another fifty men will go over the edge while I explain this. Now, oh, by the way, Utrid, this is not this is not the first time he's done it. And it's not even the first time he's done it in this episode. He has the amazing capability of saying, like, imagine how great things are going to be when you join me and we win and the rewards you'll get without mentioning, like, without you, I'm not going to win. He does it with Heston. He does it with Stiora. (laughs) (laughs) And these suckers buy it. Love it. Love it so much. You know, I just want to get through all the battle. You know, it's going crazy. Utrecht gets his revenge on his cousin, Whitgar. The Stiora's forces save King Edward. So they, Edward really does owe everybody. It, then everything has happened. We've had my boy, Father Prillig, in his boat off screen save, save the niece, Aelfwin. And sure enough, Utrecht has Bebenberg. Oh, wait, it's about to burn up. Destiny is ironic, isn't it ironic? I finally got Bedenberg, and it's about to burn down. I love that. And then it rains. What do you destiny think? Destiny is all, man. That's, destiny that's is the all. destiny. What did you think, Matt? I've kind of glossed over the big battle. Any destiny, thoughts or comments on destiny it? Destiny is a weather forecast that nobody had back in the 800s <laughs> and the 900s. And this really worked out for him. I loved the rain. And when he was so thankful... He was crying, and I was crying with him. It was one of the best cries that I had this season, and I had a lot of cries that weren't so great. But that was one of the best cries. I also want to point out that who initially went for Stiora? You Ailswith. know it. Ailswith, Edward's mommy. Catfish, does Ellsworth get any points for trying to get Stiora on Team Edward? She doesn't get Stiora out there. Uhtred doesn't see her. Oh, wow. That's a great job. She got her out there. Yeah, yeah. Ellsworth. Great job. Uh, not uh, a bossy bitch at all this season. Hey, now. Completely different. 
And I noticed she said she's going to have, she didn't say I need a room uh, with a sea view. She said, I need rooms with a sea view. Great Another. job. Nothing like having somebody who is worse than your mother-in-law living with you. <laughs> First of all, I mean, this is the end, but I have to note, I mean, she's been mentioned a few times, but this feels like a lot of Steora erasure on this podcast that mm. we've done here. What do you mean? She Let's came go. into her own as the new Uhtred after killing yep. Brita. She I said, thought she was going to be the new Brita, though, Catfish, and it no, turned out I, you're right. She, she's I the thought, new Uhtred. She's the new Uhtred. She said to him, those who have hurt me have suffered too little. I no longer believe in destiny. Mm. And now that Uhtred can't even fight baby Ethelstan uh, on the grounds without falling down and need to be helped up, she is your new queen. Destiny is Theora. Destiny is Theora. Destiny is Theora. Yeah, okay, how about this? Let's all see. think of ways we could have convinced Steora quicker to join the battle. Mm. How about this? Uh, Steora, I know you don't want to fight, but did you realize your uh, former brother-in-law, Ragnar Valder, is out there? <laughs> she would go, ah, I hate him. I mean, I got nothing. How about yeah. this? Your yeah. brother, young Uhtred, has become Nutrid because of those forces. Revenge. Yeah, yeah. And that felt a little, that, that was that was very rough at the beginning of the season when they're essentially like, well, what's he going to do now that he's not a man? I know. Ouch, <laughs> Maybe poor. he should just kill himself. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, was I mean he was wanting to be a priest <laughs> anyway. Aren't they supposed to be celibate? I think Catholic priests are. I don't know. Yeah, if I guess. Episcopal ones are. Yeah, well, I mean, he, yeah, this is interesting. Is Prillig fooled around? Biaka didn't. Father Biaka didn't. Well, Biaka I mean, had a, married. a wife. Oh, that's yeah, a good point. He got married. But did yeah. he fool around? No, he mm. didn't. But Pierlig did. In fact, okay. it was, uh, uh, hey, hey, eyes off the nuns. We got work to do here. <laughs> and Pierlig was one of the biggest ires. Yes. Listeners, we've broken down this season. We're going to uh, have some more talk about it. But once again, who cares what we think? We want to know what you think. Reach out to us on social media at Double PHQ, Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ, YouTube. Leave those comments. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you're excited about for the upcoming movie. And so we're going to now, guys, we're going to transition to the bottom of this dock. We're going to go all the way down to where we like to kind of have some moments, wrap up moments, wrap up questions and everything. And so we're going to go to everybody and we're going to ask you, what is your destiny is all moment for season five? That's your favorite moment in season five. The moment that showed it was your destiny to watch The Last Kingdom. Matt, I'm going to come to you first. What is your destiny is all moment of season five? Well, I chose two. I chose a silly one, which I'll leave off, and then I'll choose. Uh, I will choose the rain at the end. I felt like that that was a huge payoff to oh, wow. every time that he said in the recaps, "Destiny is all." That was my favorite moment. It was the most that and the scene that followed it, where he was reminiscing about all the people that he that had sacrificed themselves so that he could get there. Those were the two greatest moments for me. Catfish, what was your destiny is all moment of season five? All right. Well, listeners might be forgiven for thinking that the only episode I can remember of this is episode 10. But all of my answers uh, come from a very small area in episode 10, which is very cool. I My my Destiny is All moment is when Uhtred tells Edward to pound sand. He makes a very reasoned argument. You mean Uhtred? Uhtred makes a very reasoned argument. And he's like, you know, you uh, can't. Uh, unify this this country you you're not you you fought against some of us so i will be here and i will be the buffer and uh just the way you said it was was very reasoned and uh strong and uh you know basically he's in bebenberg so uh suck it try and come get me oh unlike edward who is uh oh. so patient all the time I thought he didn't say it so well, Catfish. I think he could have found a way to massage that deal that Uhtred and Constantine made. And I thought he was especially kind of rubbing his knife in. Edward, you've screwed up a bit by killing those Danes, by, you know, not by killing the Eldermen, by not uniting mm -hmm. us. 
even though I thought those were okay moves. Mm. I, I think, you're completely wrong. Stiora would have never forgiven him. Hmm. Okay. Well, Stiora did just help save his forces. So forgive, you know, I mean, hasn't he gone a bit far already on this? Would have never well, forgiven we're gonna, her father. We're going to, we're going to come up on that with the, uh, uh, I'll talk more about this in, in, okay, in a minute, category. in a minute. Let me yeah. say that my destiny is all moment of season five was Uhtred and Haston working together. It was so ridiculous. If you had told me, and I mentioned I've read seven of these novels, if you had told me any of the time I was reading those books or any of the previous seasons that, oh yeah, Uhtred and Heston are going to work on a scheme together to rescue people and help get Bebenberg back, I would have said, what kind of cockamamie story is this? But in the end, I just loved it. As Catfish, you've mentioned so much, Heston keeps changing sides so much that I almost want to make him my favorite character of all time. He's so <laughs> sleazy and it's- and terrible and yet he went out with a bit of honor and sure enough like everybody he's gonna get his valhalla death and so that was my destiny now all he might moment. he might get into the honorary killed by utrid club right right exactly hey let me let me in there people okay so we mentioned our destiny is all moment listeners go down in the comments tell us what your Destiny is all favorite moment of season five is. Now we're going to talk about the worst moment of season five, our arsling moment of season five. And this is very shocking because Matt's destiny of all moment, the rain that saves Bebenberg, is actually my arsling moment of the year. I thought it was just going to be a cruel twist of fate that Uhtred finally gets Bebenberg and then it burns down. And I thought, well, it'd be terrible, but he would still be the ruler. They could build it up, yada, yada, yada. But this miracle rain comes and saves him. And that was just a bit too much for me. So that was my arsling moment of season mm. five. Mm. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, Catfish, that's okay. what's yours? What's yours? All right. Well, I thought Arsling moment of the year was when someone was behaving like an Arsling. So I've got two. One of them is when uh, Uhtred was being a little bee and Stiora called him an Arsling. Appropriately. Oh, it's the first person who couldn't kick his ass in a fight who called him an Arsling and got away with it. The other one was the moment I was talking about before. Edward comes up to Uhtred and says, you did so much for my family. We owe you so much. Now bow in obeisance. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <What a> dick. <laughs> Love Edward. Good work, Edward. <laughs> I owe you my life. Now get down on your knee and pledge <laughs> your life for mine. Yeah. Love it. Okay, Matt. Um, I'm worried. What is your arsling moment of season five? Well, I was going to say anytime Ethelhelm opens his mouth, but instead I've settled on Uhtred being so discriminatory when he never had any sense of discrimination in regards to women at all. Tall girl from Frieza is too tall. Oh, my um, goodness. That's just discrimination. You don't do Terrible. vertical discrimination in this in today's day and age. You he just was cute, do Utrid. She I hope cute. he made up for it somehow. Well, yeah. he did He did try to hook up with her later, you know, which is yet another arsling moment because he went back on his own word to himself. Mm. Oh, man. The, all good arsling moments. Again, listeners, at double PHQ, the word double, the single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters. Let us know your arsling moment of season five. Guys, I'm going to give you some rapid-fire questions now. Season 5, who had the best death? Was it Lady Ethelfled's cancer? Was it Osfer's death in battle? Was it Brita's arrow in the back? Was it Ethelhelm's, you know, self-stab in the throat and up the chin? Was it Withgar falling off the balcony and getting stabbed? Was it Heston getting killed by Constantine? Ale fled, pretending she was Alice to save Alice's life. Was it Sig Trigger? Was it the goon Bressel, who was one of Ethelhelm's men? Was it the nice Dame Walland, who was kind of part of Sig Trigger's right-hand man who died in the final battle? Was it Breda's daughter, who fell off the roof? Or was it Hela? And you may be like, who's Hela? Well, Hela was Stiora's good friend in York. You can have any of these or some that aren't on the board that I haven't mentioned. Catfish, who had the best death of season five? Well, I'll do two. Uh, my my uh, the worst death for me was uh, Sig Trigger. Mm, uh, my okay. favorite death was uh, Viva Case, <laughs> when she fell and Brita couldn't catch her. I'll catch you. I'll yeah. catch you. It's yeah, a jump, I loved that. I was like jump. in your face, Brita. Oh, Matt. Perhaps not the, the best way to look at this, Bubba. Perhaps not the best way to look at this, but okay. Uh, I'm taking best death to mean the one that affected me most. Ooh, okay. and I'm going Osfirth. He was mm. so scared, man. He was so scared. That that was terrifying. Um, that was was the one that affected me the most. 
All right, listeners, tell us, what do you think was the best death? And you can define it best any way you want in season five. Rapid fire question two, which of these characters is the most frustrating king? Now, Alfred died a couple seasons ago, but I'm throwing him in this. You can have Alfred, his son, King Edward, or new Scottish king, Constantine. Who is the most frustrating king on The Last Kingdom? If you have another choice besides these, I can hear him. Matt, most frustrating king. I'm going to go Constantine because I did feel frustrated that I didn't get to know him well enough. Catfish. All right. My first answer is Burger. But after that, I'm going to say Alfred. It, you, it, was, it was so much uh, the way he thought. I, I understood. But it just his back and forth and, 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 and messing around with Uhtred's life so much. Just an incredible character and so frustrating. For me, then, I will choose King Edward as most frustrating, mainly because he got to fool around with this new queen of his, you know, while he was still married. And he, now he's got a new queen and a new son. And this actress who plays uh, Agafu, however you pronounce her name, she was really cute on that show Lodge 49. So the fact that now she's fooling around with Edward, frustrating for me. All right. Hey, who, another one here. The most, let's hear it. most surprising return mm -hmm. in, in, in this season. Was it Osbert? Hasten or uh, Ellsworth being a bossy bitch? What was the most surprising <laughs> return in this season from previous seasons? I'll go first. Ellsworth being bossy is not a surprise. <laughs> the least <laughs> surprising thing ever. For me, I want to say Hild because I, I, I couldn't believe she was back. I was so happy she was back. In, and even Heston. But I, was, I wasn't surprised he was back, but how he came back. But for me, it was Osbert. I really did have to Google, wait a minute, who's Osbert again? To remember, oh, yes, Uhtred had a third son. So for me, most surprising return, Osbert. How about you, Matt? Catfish, it, for you, it has to be Elswith, right? Because you said that she was <laughs> dead at the end of season four. And I maintain that she was not. However, I'm going to go with Hild just because okay. I really... I didn't know if that actress was even available anymore to them, if she had signed anything or w would agree to do anymore and to see her and, and to see her active in it, not just a cameo or anything. It was per it was perfect. So that was great. I want to say it was Ailes with being a bossy bitch because I thought she would have had her cup up. It's by now. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Only the good die young, Catfish. Only the good die young. Another rapid fire question. We lost a lot of people this season, but we also met some new characters. I met, I mentioned Edward's new queen, Lady Agafu. We have Sig Trigger's drunk slash traitorous slash redeemed question mark brother, Rog Valder. We have Scottish King Constantine. We have Gamble and Debt Father Benedict. Anybody have a new favorite character for season five? Matt, what do you think? Same way that he was the most frustrating king for me. Uh, Constantine is my new favorite character. Uh, I can't wait to see what they do with him in the movie. Obviously, he's probably going to be in this because this is an unfinished. It's the one bit of unfinished business that's going on is between him and Edward. So I really liked what they gave us of him, but I want to know more. Catfish, do you have a favorite new character? This yeah, season? I'm going to go with Rog Mulder just because, I mean, you know, he was like a blazing common across the sky, a <laughs> drunken, traitorous killing untrustable just son of a gun and a good looking dude and he just flashed across season five burning brightly yeah his hands were burning brightly when he <laughs> i'm gonna give it to agafu again because she is so cute all right our final rapid fire question and maybe this gets us pointed towards the next season who should be king after edward should it be his firstborn son Athel stan who's been hanging out with Uhtred? Should it be his second-born son, traitorous Aethelhelm's grandson, Aelfoyard, who ends the season seemingly in a prison? Or but should it be his new son? very fancy one. Right. Or should it be his new son with his new bride? Who do you, what do you think, Catfish? Who should be king after Edward? And I know we can go to Wikipedia and find out. Let's not. Who should be king? I did I did go to Wikipedia and find oh, out. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so not who will, who should be. Well, I think it should be Athelstan simply because he has the trust of the Danes, but he also, I think, uh, believes in the idea of England. Mm. Matt, who, who should be king after Edward? Never bet on an unborn child, especially in the Dark Ages. Just don't okay. do it. So I'm going to also agree with Catfish and say that Athelstan should be the next king. He was the firstborn. Granted, the marriage was dissolved, but 
they did get married though yeah. secretly did they not right, right. It, yes it's one of these things where osforth this season would call ethel stan bastard but that was because of what you said the marriage was for lack of better purposes uh annulled or or you know taken away and so right. and so he was in a odd place i, I mean was, historically he was the child of king edward's consort and not wife mm, mm. terrible Ter- what do you mean of course that's what the history books say, but the Last Kingdom books say, <laughs> "Right." Hey, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll stick with you. I think Ethel Stan. This is always tricky when you have a new actor who has to come in and play like the teen or elder version of a kid, and he has to get the audience to like him. The audi- the show really did try to get us to like Ethel Stan. I think it. I don't think it necessarily made us hate Alf Weird, the uh, jailed son at the end, but I think it did make us like Ethel Stan. So that's good. All right, our final rapid-fire question before we get to your feedback and we talk about the upcoming closing movie. I started to pull these. We don't always do this on our Last Kingdom podcast, but uh, some of the best lines of season five. So here's some that I noted. It's, destiny is for our slings. I do not want it. We have Prillig, who describes him taking a piss on a tree as holy water. Mm. We had Uhtred to Sigtrigger. Wait, if you die before I do, my daughter will not forgive it. We had Uhtred. When he found out about his secret gate with Ethel fled. So after all these years, I could have been sneaking in here to hump you. <laughs> we have Uhtred to Stiora when he's t- trying to tell, take, tell her to take Edward's deal. He says, forgive with your mouth, but with your heart, be silent. Brita to Uhtred, which is a stone cold diss. You know, they're talking trash. She's like, oh, yeah. You know, Uhtred says something like pain and suffering. And she's like, oh, that's what your son said when he begged to keep his balls. Oh, boom. Oh. This is with Gar to Ethelhelm when he's talking about Bebenberg. <laughs> with Gar says the classic line, Bebenberg, you've probably heard of it. <laughs> Very modern of you, with Gar. Uh, we have Ethelhelm to Withgar. The men I count as friends do not die so easily. A very Trump line of like, I like soldiers that don't die. Oh my goodness, Ethelhelm, so good. Constantine to his future possible bride, Hilfwin. He says, by your own admission, you are barely a lady. Oh, stop. Cold. We have Ailes with King Edward's mom saying, I killed a man with my bare hands. I drove a knife through a man's throat without wearing gloves. Hello. Hashtag mic drop. And we had Uhtred gave this line. The man who can unify this country must be a figure behind which the people can stand together as one. That and is you stone are not cold, that man. Oh, stone cold this to Edward. Okay. Double M, Matt Murdock. Do you have a bad, best line of season five? Oh, boy. I'm going to save Catfish the misery of voting for Aylesworth. And I will instead go to the line in, as they're going into the sewers where Uhtred says to Sig Trigger, wait, if you die before I do, my daughter will not forgive it. Uh, mm. That That's the whole reason why he turned Edward down, too. Yep, and he and Sig Trigger did die. Ooh, catfish, favorite line. I mean, I'm going to have to go with, uh, because, uh, you know, we, we uh, Bubba, you and I have a fondness for the bad boys, and there was no badder boy this season in Ethelhelm. And when he says, the men I count as friends do not die so easily. Oh, oh. zing a ding. If you're it. dead, I got no use for you. Mm. That's good. I'm going to go what with about Br- you, Bubba. I'm going to go with Brita. When she is stone cold trying to get Uhtred to just explode and says, that's what your son said when your son said when he begged to keep his balls. Ouch, that is stone cold, Brita. Love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We haven't been setting this up, but one thing we do every time here on Double PHQ is have our musical expert, Double M, Matt Murdock, talk about the music of the season. Matt, you liked it this year. What are you going to talk about this time? Well, I really did like it. Uh, this time uh, Paul Stetter and, and Lunn they really didn't change their approach that much but they did do some things by altering themes a little bit in order to or at least altering the basic structure of those themes in order to follow the emotion of the moment in this particular season which was so important given that this was such an emotional season
That music is from episode two, where Ethelflaed tells Aldhelm that, you know, her breast cancer is terminal and it's around the 21 minute mark. That progression, if you notice, the chords keep sinking lower and lower and that creates the feeling of sadness. Additionally, it's in a minor key. Minor keys always make us feel more dark than major keys. Major keys tend to make us feel lighter. Not here. The melody clearly outlines the fact that it's minor, and it kind of noodles around, which the shape of that creates um, a sense of uncertainty because of that. It also kind of crosses the the bar, the places where the downbeat drops in ways uh, that, of course, exemplify a little bit of confusion, the same way that Aethelflaed must feel confused by the fact that this can't be cured, that she's having to face her own death. But one of the things that is very important with this is that this chord progression, this sinking chord progression is actually used in this very episode at about the 12 minute mark when Brita sends uh, Sig Trigger out uh, to find Uhtred, uh, and and if he doesn't, then she's going to find Steor and, and kill her. It's the exact same harmony, but there are differences. And this is where I feel like that uh, Paul Stetter and Loon did very good this season, whereas the scene with Brita, there's different percussion. There's a different melody. There's all kinds of different things that are going on with, the sick trigger melody as opposed to this Ethelfled melody. It's much more aggressive because Brita has placed sick trigger on an aggressive mission, right? Bring me back Uhtred so I can kill him. And I'm going to get to that theme here in a little bit. But first I want to focus on the fact that even though those progressions are the same, there were alterations in order to follow the emotions of each of the scenes. I want to focus on the Ethelfled scene here for just a second because there is a moment after you hear this melody that then just the progression is played, just the harmony parts, and they're done with these kind of synth pads. And this is as she's speaking to Aldhelm and he is expressing his own grief. You know, she asks if Uhtred should have been told, and he says, no, he'd go face Brita with a broken heart, and he's heartbroken as well. And then she says, we must go on. So first, she asks Adhelm the question, and we hear just the pad of the tonic key. And then after we hear his grief, and she says, no, we must go on, then things change. We get a lifting chord that's actually a half step higher that demonstrates Ethelfled's resolve. And then the progression continues again, but this time there's a high note on top of it, which is keeping it anchored. No matter how low the harmony goes, this high note demonstrates her resolve against this sadness and that sequence from the raised note sounds like this what that high note does is it makes us think back to the tonic and so therefore no matter where the chords go it's making us think about where home is. And yes, there's sadness there, but we always want to get home, right? And so by that high note being there, it psychologically makes us want to get home. And you don't even realize these things as you're hearing them. But when I hear the fifth note of a key, being held against every other chord, then I know 
that the composer is trying to make us feel, if not hope, at least resolve, which is what Ethel Flett is doing. She's finding resolve in her situation. Now let's take a look at that progression itself, because it is the one thing that is in common between the two themes that I'm going to be talking about from the same episode. But the progression starts off like something that we're very familiar with. It feels like it's going to be this descending thing from the root down to the fifth, like this. And naturally, when you get to that bottom note, you're going to feel like you need to have this note in there somewhere so that it'll feel like it's really ready to go home. Here's the odd thing. Paul Stetter and Loon did a great job of making you feel even lower by implying the note that I just played over the top of a progression that gets lower than what we were expecting. What we got, instead of what I just played earlier, is this. And yet, they stick the note that we expect to resolve back home on top of that even lower note. That creates a dominant effect, which is very tense. It needs to resolve between that very low note and the higher note. That increases our sadness. Now, that note is present in the chords of the Ethel Fled scene, but not in the melody. But in the Brita melody, that note that sticks out actually becomes part of the melody as well. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. I'm going to play the music from the scene where Brita sends Sig Trigger off, and you'll hear this note in the melody itself. But that lower note is still even more sinking, and that makes us feel even worse. So and Catfish, Catfish, did you, Matt is talking about why this season's score is so much better than last season's. Did you notice the score? Um, you no, know, I, I did. I didn't really notice the score uh, that much. It's not something that I usually notice unless something is really emphasized or if something uh, really uh, sticks out as odd. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I just thought it was so much better this time around because some of the more traditional conventions that I'm used to with the film score as opposed to there, there's really two kind of schools of thought. And one of them is, well, we create some themes and then we just let the director lay them down underneath wherever he feels they work. And then there is, let's tailor this stuff directly to the moment, which is more of the line of my favorite composers, like a Giacchino or a Ramin Javadi or a Lauren Balf. That's the kind of thing that they do. Or I reluctantly even say, even Ludwig, does this uh, on, on occasionally. I felt like uh, Joe did it much better in, in Boba Fett than Ludwig usually does in Mandalorian. Nonetheless, I really felt like this time around it was it was much more tailored to suit the emotional need, which is something you're not really supposed to notice unless you're just a music geek like me who that's what you pay attention to more so than the plot, which is why you say that Edward was both impatient and patient <laughs> within the same sentence. Hey, listeners, we love your feedback because we just recapped the seasons here on Double PHQ. A lot of times we have to wait a, a, a year before we can read your feedback in a podcast. If you send your feedback now on season five, we will read it when we review the final movie, Seven Kingdoms Must Die. Now, we do have some feedback for season four. So, Catfish, what did we hear from on YouTube? Well, from Wind America, we heard, she said, my arsling moment of season four was when Uhtred... Arsling of Uhtred, after the Battle of Tettenhall, could have slain Breeda to save her Viking soul from being enslaved yep. by the Welsh so she could die with a weapon in her hand and go to Valhalla. He just stood there like an Arsling, letting her be hauled away. A painful decision, no doubt, but one he owed to Breeda. Man up! Mm, well, when Look America at all the trouble it caused. That. Yeah, it did cause a lot of trouble by not letting her to go to Valhalla then. 
you know, he, she was pregnant, and so he let her daughter get born so she could die a, a dozen years later. <laughs> Good work, Uhtred. So according to Matt, Uhtred is responsible for all those deaths. Oh, man. So what do you guys think? Is Uhtred to blame? Let yes. us know. He loves letting Brita get away, that's for sure. I mean, he held. it was the first girl he held hands with, probably the first girl he made out with, the first girl for a lot of things. So, you yeah. know, it goes a long way. Okay. Hey, yeah, I held hands with you. You're the first person I held hands with. Please go commit mass murder. That's right. Sla slaughter this village. Hey, guys, this isn't the end somehow. There are three more books in Bernard Cornwell's Saxon Stories book series that haven't been covered. And so we're going to get a two hour, that is a 120 minute movie to cover the plots of the remaining novels, which are War of the Wolf, Sword of Kings and Warlord. And so this movie is going to be on Netflix. It's currently filming. It's going to be going for a while. And what's going to happen is, is that after successfully reclaiming his ancestral home of Bebenberg, and in order for Uhtred to keep the peace, the Saxon Dane of Uhtred promised to remain independent of any war between King Constantine of Alba, a.k.a. Scotland, and King Edward of Wessex. But an independent Bebenberg means Edward's dream of a unified England remains in doubt. Will another Wessex king go against his word and betray Uhtred? All Uhtred dreams to do is to live out his days in Bebenberg and Pete. But fate and destiny may have ulterior motives. And once again, Uhtred will be at the heart of shaping the future of England. <laughs> Hell yes. Do we want to guess at who these seven kings might be, who seven kings must die? Well, we know we have Edward. We have King Constantine. I honestly fear that Rog Valder, Sigtrigger's brother, is going to try to declare himself a king around uh, York and such. And so that would be three of the seven. We know Edward has three sons, Ethel Stan. He's got Elf Weird, and he's got uh, this new son. So that gets us to six. Who would be the seventh king? Is it Uhtred? Any ideas? Once again, don't spoil from history if anybody knows or read the books. But any thoughts, guys? Why not Peerlick? Hell yeah, king. King of kings. Matt, any thoughts about who the seventh king might be, who these kings might be, or what are your uh, what is your excitement level for this final am I Am I taking the, lit the title too literally it, by saying that seven kings will die? Mm. Because I feel like that it, it, seven kings must die could just be something that somebody like Ethelhelm would have said at the beginning of season five. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's like, uh, I don't I don't know that there's going to be seven kings to die. And if there were, I wouldn't even begin to tell you who a seventh king might be. All right. Catfish, what yes. is your excitement level for this upcoming movie in a year? I mean, it's 10. I'm 10 out of 10. I'm all in for Uhtred, <laughs> looking young. Ethel Stan <laughs> aged up with a beard. Um, <laughs> Elf Weird's got a cane. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, listeners, once again, we ask you for your feedback because we love this show and we want to share it with you at Double PHQ. The word double, single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters, at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. If you're watching this on YouTube, listening on YouTube, go down to those comments and leave these comments. For everybody here at Double PHQ, my name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGMan67 on Twitter. And I am Matt, and you can hit me up at Musical Concepts on Twitter. Just go to the March 9th dates and find my string of tweets where I suffer in front of your very eyes. Oh, man. Our next show we're going to be covering here on the Double P Podcast Network is most likely the Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney Plus show coming up in May. But please follow us on social media to hear about all the fun things we're doing and talking about. For everybody here, you'll hear us next time. And Destiny, Destiny is, is all. all. A movie is all. And what's going to happen is, is that after successfully reclaiming his ancestral home of Bebenberg, and in order for Uhtred to keep the peace, the Saxon Dane of Uhtred promised to remain independent of any war between King Constantine of Alba, a.k.a. Scotland, and King Edward of Wessex. But an independent Bebenberg means Edward's dream of a unified England remains in doubt. So, will another Wessex king go against his word and betray Uhtred? 
All Uhtred dreams to do is to live out his days in Bepperberg and Pete, but fate and destiny may have ulterior motives. And once again, Uhtred will be at the heart of shaping the future of England. Mm-hmm. Hell yes. Do we want to guess at who these seven kings might be? Who seven kings must die? Well, we know we have Edward. We have King Constantine. I honestly fear that Rog Rogvalder, Sig Trigger's brother, is going to try to declare himself a king around uh, York and such. And so that would be three of the seven. We know Edward has three sons: Ethel, Stan. He's got Elf Weird. And he's got uh, this new son, so that gets us to six. Who would be the seventh king? Is it Uhtred? Any ideas? Once again, don't spoil from history if anybody knows or read the books. But any thoughts, guys? Why not Peerlick? Hell yeah, king. King of kings. Matt, any thoughts about who the seventh king might be, who these kings might be, or what are your uh, what is your excitement level for this final am I Am I taking the, lit- the title too literally by saying that seven kings will die? Mm. Because I feel like that it, it, seven kings must die could just be something that somebody like Ethelhelm would have said at the beginning of season five. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's like uh, I don't I don't know that there's going to be seven kings to die. And if there were, I wouldn't even begin to tell you who a seventh king might be. All right. Catfish, what yes. is your excitement level for this upcoming movie in a year? I mean, it's 10. I'm 10 out of 10. I'm all in for Uhtred, uh, you know, uh, looking <laughs> looking young. Ethelstan <laughs> aged up with a beard. Um, <laughs> Elfweird's got a cane. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, listeners, once again, we ask you for your feedback because we love this show and we want to share it with you at Double PHQ. The word double, single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters, at Double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Double PHQ. If you're watching this on YouTube, listening on YouTube, go down to those comments and leave these comments. For everybody here at Double PHQ, my name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Catfish. You can hit me up at CJGman67 on Twitter. And I am Matt, and you can hit me up at Musical Concepts on Twitter. Just go to the March 9th. Uh, dates and find my string of tweets where I suffer in front of your very eyes. Oh man. Our next show we're going to be covering here on the double P podcast network is most likely the Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney plus show coming up in May, but please follow us on social media to hear about all the fun things we're doing and talking about for everybody here. We'll you'll hear us next time. And destiny Destiny is is all. all A movie is all. Steor right. is a bad bitch. <laughs> Wait a minute, Steor is a bitch. Um, no, but uh, she's a. That's different. She's a bad bitch. Okay. <laughs>